Welcome to another series uh, of Culture Matters at here at Asia Society. Today is a really special conversation with Sharon Salzberg and Anugupta. And it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Sharon back again, who's been here uh, many times. And it's particularly timely to be having this book launched today uh, here at Asia Society uh, uh, for so many different reasons. But I think at this moment where thinking about the mindfulness and this kind of time of pause and this of social action and all of us trying to do a kind of balancing act of, of figuring out where we can find ourselves and how we can be effective both for ourselves and, and at a global level. And that is so much at the heart of this fabulous book, which I hope you will all have a chance to read. And uh, if you don't know Sharon Salzberg's work, she teaches meditation. She's been doing this for many, many years. I've practiced with her for quite a long time. And uh, I was particularly excited about this book because for me, this was the coming together of, of both my aspiration for, for taking the work to the outside world and trying to be effective. And at the same time, thinking about the inner journey that helps that to, to become a reality. And I've just met Anugupta, uh, but I already feel like there's such an affinity. He's a scientist, educator, lawyer, and the founder of Be More with Anu. So I hope all of you will be more with Anu. <laughs> he has logged in over 10,000 hours of meditation. He, uh, and in fact, spent some time in Mandalay, which I was pleased to hear, having spent some time in, in Burma, now Myanmar. Uh, but to have this conversation, he's, he and his story is in the book, and what's so exciting about the book is, is the stories that come out from people who are practitioners, some of them very overtly so, and some of them, you feel it through their work. Um, whether it goes from Lin-Manuel Miranda, who we don't know if he's practicing, but there's something to that Hamilton. Uh, or if we're talking about Anu's work or Malika Dutt or Bell Hooks, people who are so inspiring, but who take a, a kind of personal practice as a part of what enriches them in, in their uh, outward practice. And one of the things we were talking about a little earlier was that idea of of a kind of interdependence, as it were, and a kind of intersection. And, and Sharon, I'm just wondering if, if both you and Anu could talk a little bit about that. Maybe, Sharon, if you could start us off. Sure. Well, thank you so much. And uh, it's wonderful to, in effect, be here, although I'm not exactly there, but I'm, I'm sort of there uh, at the same time, and to be with, with both of you and all of you. And... Um, you know, somebody sent me a quotation of myself from about 10 years ago, which is always an interesting experience. <laughs> like, what did I say? And the quotation is something I still say very often, which is that interconnection is just the reality of experience. It's something we may overlook or look the other way from, but it's actually how things are. And so the quotation was saying, it's not just a meditative understanding that points to the fact that our lives are interdependent, they're linked together. Certainly economics shows us this, science shows us this, environmental consciousness certainly shows us this, and even epidemiology shows us this. So I, I for years and years, have been using the term epidemiology, partly because of my very old friendship with Larry Brilliant, whom I saw on, on this series, uh, you know, dating from when we were both living in India and his, his work in the smallpox campaign. And people used to say to me like 10 years ago, what, what does that word mean? Or why are you using that word? What does that mean? What does that do with anything? Uh, and here we are, you know. So uh, in so many ways, um, this time, this pandemic is showing us in a way almost like the terrible face of interconnection and the, the beautiful face of interconnection is the fact that we can find ourselves in one another, that we can have compassion in a, a really extensive way. And so uh, I think one of the reasons that a lot of people think of compassion 
as weak or um, giving in or, or something that is like uh, saccharine sweet, it's too sweet, is, is a misunderstanding. I think it's actually an, an incredibly empowered stance because it's resting on the truth of how interconnected our lives are. Anu, how about you? Absolutely. Um, well, first of all, I want to just thank everyone for joining us and thank you for having me in this conversation with my teacher and friend, Sharon. Um, this is such an empowering book and, you know, I really hope that particularly all young people um, who are struggling and are at the forefront of various movements that are taking place right now really take some time to read this book. Um, and I'm really grateful that some of my stories are shared in there, but also stories of so many incredible and inspiring people. And you know, this question, Rachel, that you've asked is something that's really dear to me and really goes to how um, I began my journey. So, you know, as you know, or some of you may know that my work is really around helping professionals break unconscious bias. So racial bias, gender bias, so we can create a world where there's more equity and belonging. And for me, that work is, of course, I have all the degrees and I've studied this very intimately, but it really started because of my personal journey. And that personal journey was really around feeling separate. Um, I felt separate because of the way I look, because of my race, my ethnicity, my religious background, my immigration status, my sexuality, my gender. So there were so many ways that the society in which I lived and I grew up in you know, I grew up in India until I was 10 years old and I moved to New York City and grew up here for the remainder of my time, just feeling the sense of not belonging. And I think the beauty of this book and of mindfulness practice for me is really around understanding that nothing operates in isolation. You know, um, one of the things, and I practice the Dharma, so I know that one of the things, one of the quotes that I love by the Buddha is, um, I'm going to get, I hope I get this right, is this is because that is, and that is because this is, right? So it's literally like what he's describing is interconnection, interdependence. And for me personally, of course, there's been a lot of wounding that I experienced because of my various, you know, demographic identities or psychographic uh, identities. But the people that helped me through it, the books, the podcasts, the movies, the friends, the mentors, the teachers, came from all different backgrounds. So even if I had racial wounding, it was actually a lot of people like my Susan Davis, who's like my mentor, my friend, my, you know, my angel, I would even say, you know, here she is, a white woman, right, externally, but I am because of her and she is because of me. So that element of interdependence has been really, really transformative for me. And I think for my work around breaking unconscious bias, it really starts there. It starts with mindfulness and it starts with helping people become aware of that interdependence. Um, and of course, then moving into hard practices like compassion, and empathy and joy, and really building those as skills um, to live a more fulfilling life, you know, together. So those skills are not so easy. I mean, how, how do we look at these as skills? These sound like grandiose ideas. Okay, um, I'd love for to Sharon to pop in here because she's been doing this and teaching folks um, for you know, 40, 50 plus years. Um, but I think the only thing I would say is, yes, they're not easy, but they're simple. So, and- well, That's good. <laughs> they're simple, they're straightforward. And the way we do it, um, basically, based on the science, is that we've created a framework of PRISM. So PRISM is an acronym for five of these tools, perspective taking, pro-social behaviors, individuation, stereotype replacement, and mindfulness. And if, you, if one thinks about these tools, all of this really starts with mindfulness. And mindfulness, the way I like to just describe it is that is the act of noticing or remembering. That's it. So if a stereotype arises, we notice it. We don't push it away. If shame arises as a result of it, we notice that too. And then we kind of build up to, you know, replacing those stereotypes, again, rewiring the brain, to then moving into individuation, which is, you know, decoupling these group-based stereotypes from the individual 
And that is also known as curiosity, you know? And then we move to these tools around pro-social behaviors and perspective taking, which are really hard practices. You know, in the Buddhist tradition, these are known as the Rama Viharas, you know, things around metta, you know, loving kindness, karuna, compassion, equanimity, you know, peka and mudita, which is joy, but also things like gratitude, generosity. And that's where we're kind of really, you know, building capacity of our heart to really hold the suffering that of ourselves and other beings, and then use that capacity to act. Well, one of the things I really love about Anu's work is that he's taken a very classical model and made it um, understandable and relevant for today's world in a way that doesn't, in, in my view, doesn't lose anything. You know, it, it reflects so strongly back to how I was taught in India, lo those many years ago, um, where, you know, these days the word mindfulness, of course, is very popular. When I came back from India as a meditation teacher, it was 1974, and nobody ever used the word. They didn't think of meditation as something uh, kind of scientific. It was, it was considered very odd and, and exotic and woo-woo in a way. Um, but as mindfulness has gotten much more popular, I think that what has been most strongly emphasized is a benefit that's hugely important for us, but is not a complete picture. And that is a sense of fully inhabiting our lives to, um, you know, really experience drinking that cup of tea because for once we're not multitasking and we're not hugely distracted and we are more completely present with our experience, which makes quite an enormous difference in our level of fulfillment and happiness and so on. But classically, mindfulness was designed to not only have us inhabit our lives more fully, but to understand our lives. Mm -hmm. It actually was a compound. It's sati, which is mindfulness, sampajanya, which means clear comprehension. Mm -hmm. And that's how I was taught. So all those things Anu was saying, like perspective taking and seeing, you know, the, the stories that maybe others have told about us that we have absorbed and we've kind of come to believe, we get enough space from what is arising in our minds that we can see that is a story. And is it true? You know, we don't have to dismiss it out of hand, but we get to have that curiosity. Is it true? Is it just something that I have absorbed? And we get to see the um, paths we have undertaken, maybe habitually, of separation or disconnection or whatever it might be that we think make us strong and happy, we take a look and like, really, <laughs> is that true? Or maybe these other qualities, these more heartfelt qualities like compassion, which perhaps we have been taught are kind of stupid or, you know, people will just take advantage of you. Or um, even now I'm told, you know, if you put in a word in search in Google, uh, Google will offer you suggestions because they think well, this is so likely what you are searching for because so many others have searched for that very thing. I'm told that if you type in compassion, you'll get fatigue right away because oh they think you're interested in compassion fatigue because so many people are. Um, you know, we get to see for ourselves. It's like we, in, in meditation, we are our own laboratory. We get to see for ourselves. And that's why I think it can have uh, an influence and effect on what we call implicit bias or unconscious bias because it's no longer unconscious. Yeah. And that's so beautiful, Sharon, because that is the work of mindfulness. You know, basically, um, we're making the unconscious conscious. And once we make the unconscious conscious, we can't forget it, right? And that is what allows us to begin to shift our mindsets, shift our habits, and then shift our behavior. And I think at this time, we're being called to do that together in community. So, you know, it's interesting. I've been talking to a lot of young people who are on the streets right now. And of course, I also talk to um, older generations of activists and advocates who, whose shoulders really stand on. And there's this interesting tension that's coming up because the old model um, around social movements is that we need a leader. 
right? So civil rights leader, you know, women's women's rights, women's liberation, gay liberation, all of these movements had like specific, um, you know, figureheads that really led them. And what's happening right now with a lot of young people and, you know, I consider myself on the older end of these young people, um, <laughs> no longer in my 20s, um, is that this is becoming more of a leaderless movement in the sense that so many people are doing this work themselves. And what's beautiful about what you shared, Sharon, is, and I'd love for you to, you know, share more about what it was like for you to be in India, you know, in your early days, particularly coming in as a Westerner, as someone who was the age of a lot of young people who are on the streets right now. Um, you know, like, what brought you there? And what, how did it help you heal? But the last thing I want to just say is that um, in Asian languages, you know, I speak um, Hindi mostly, but I've learned Korean and, you know, um, some Burmese in the past. The word for, you know, mind isn't mind, it's actually mind heart. So like when I say like in Hindi, it's man, it actually means mind and heart. So when we actually are saying mindfulness, when we're translating that, it's actually mind dash heartfulness, you know? <laughs> Um, and I think it sometimes doesn't get captured um, right now. So I would love for you actually, but using that, I'd love to like hear and really be, um, I think for me, for personally, uh, my personal reasons, just what that was like for you as a young person. Yeah, well, I was 18 when I went to India. Uh, I am a product of the New York City public school systems, which meant I skipped two grades. And so I went to college when I was 16. And I went to India in my junior year of, of college. It was sort of like my junior year abroad. I created an independent study project because I so wanted to learn how to meditate, having taken an Asian philosophy course as a sophomore. And it was it, it's a remarkable moment. I look back on it often, like, why didn't I say, I think I'll study this further, or maybe I'll go to graduate school and emphasize this, or whatever. I thought, no, I've got to learn how to do it. And, and obviously that was the critical moment of my life. And um, I created this project. I said, I want to go to India and learn how to meditate. And they said, okay, this was 1970. And education was kind of like that uh, in those days more. And so I went and I was very interested in the practical, direct teaching of how to. I wasn't particularly interested in the philosophy or assuming an identity or rejecting anything else, but I wanted to learn how to. And that got me out of New York City and Buffalo, where I was going to college, to uh, India. I had never even been to California before. <laughs> um, I just, I had to go. And uh, I was, I think, you know, I was also very moved, Anu, by what you were saying earlier about belonging, because I think that was the central issue of my life as it is for many people. I'd had a very traumatic childhood with a lot of disruption. My family didn't look like other families and it was uh, very painful for me. And it was also the case that like for many people, my family system was one where these things were never spoken about. You know, like my mother died when I was nine and my father was gone. It was just, it was very complex. and. So all of those feelings I had inside were not getting any external affirmation. And it was only actually when I did this Asian philosophy class and I heard of the Buddha's teaching where he said, there is suffering in life, hmm. which did not seem to me a depressing message. It was very liberating. It was like, oh, it's not just me. I'm not so weird. I'm not different. This is a part of life. And, and again, you know, it's often in, in that recognition of the universality, not that we all suffer to the same degree, but we're all so vulnerable. I mean, look at this time. And we can find one another in that vulnerability. And that's what happened to me. I had a sense of belonging and not being on the margins for the first time in my life. And I think that's part of what happens in the process of meditating because there are many stories that have been told about each of us that we do absorb. And um, I was actually in Kentucky uh, teaching with Bell Hooks at, at her institute. And um, I 
said that, you know, because it's one of the themes that I, I really like to explore. And somebody in the group said, well, I don't believe that, you know, people, other people don't tell stories about us. Like they don't know us. How could they be telling a story about us? And I said, everything tells a story about us. Architecture tells a story about us. Do you belong? Do you not belong? Um, everything, you know, the, there's such a, a massive amount of input and, to get to realize that, oh, my sense of belonging, of feeling at home in this body or in this mind or on this earth actually doesn't depend on that externalized, now internalized view. It's something else I can find that where I can declare that. One of the things I loved when you held up the cover of the book, because uh, a character in my book, as well as, as quoting you and uh, Susan Davis, another wonderful activist, is the Statue of Liberty because the Statue of Liberty is my icon. Mm. And I I love that message. You belong, no matter who you are, how wretched, you know, and uh, how poor. It doesn't matter. You belong. There's a home here for you. And somebody pointed out to me that the color of the cover of the book is the same color as the Statue of Liberty. So <laughs> I was exceedingly happy. Not a coincidence at all, you know, in that way. And and I think it's with the word liberty and belonging are so interconnected, right? Because I think oftentimes we feel that we don't have the liberty to be our true self and thereby we don't feel like we belong. And thank you for sharing that story. Um, and I can really resonate with that myself because, you know, for such a long time, I didn't feel like I belonged forget the world, forget the, you know, the societies I was growing up or the family dysfunction. And because my family immigrated to the US, there was a lot of disruption there, but I didn't feel like I belonged to my body. You know, I remember that, you know, after college, I lived in Korea for a year. I was teaching English there. And that was when I really began practicing mindfulness more consistently. And this one time um, I was taking this interesting mixed martial arts class. And I would go to, to my um, my Sansing name, that's the word for a teacher in Korean. And for the first five minutes, he would like hold my shoulders and pull them down. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, I didn't know, because like, I was like this. And I, God knows how long I like lived my life like this. And I remember, like I so remember this, um, I started practicing yoga regularly. And this was my, third year in law school, so this was like 2010 or something, I was in Shavasana at the end of the class and I got up and I literally felt this. And I, that moment I freaked out. I'm like, did anyone see that? Like what just happened? But I think for me, after practicing for so long, you know, and being consistent around it, something in my body that was unconsciously holding all of the all of the ways i felt like i didn't belong finally felt like it belonged and i think that was like a really powerful moment for me um you know. i'm really curious because this is a very personal story but it has led you to the work that you're doing so how do you make that how do you make that change from something that you discover that that's so intrinsic to who you are to something that you can share that that then can become part of a larger movement as it were yeah no absolutely i think so there's two parts of the sh uh, story so the first part is that because i felt like i didn't belong in this body i went through a massive depression in my early 20s um, no one knew about it because i was just holding up appearances i was you know and of course being born male there was a lot of expectation, particularly in an Indian immigrant family, that I had to be tough. But inside, I was like, you know, craving for help, for, but I couldn't show it. So I actually came to a head and I attempted suicide. You know, my, I think it was the beginning of my second year of law school, but thankfully I didn't. And this is because, I, I mean, I credit this to grace, to mindfulness, because the moment I was about to do it, I began seeing thoughts in my mind and became so acutely aware of thoughts. And in that moment, I was like, wait, if these are thoughts, who am I? And 
if these thoughts are telling you to do this, who am I, right? So that's when I kind of got off the ledge. And of course, immediately got help um, and have, you know, been, you know, practicing various tools to really understand all of these issues. But it became connected to social movements for me. Um, the following year, I was working in New Orleans. And, you know, I went to law school still wanting to do international development, international human rights work. Um, and the interesting thing was, I was working in the New Orleans um, prisons and court system. And this one time I was noticing, you know, literally young black boys, 15, 16 years of age, being sentenced to prison for three, four, five years at a time for incredibly petty things, things like breaking cell phones, trespass to property. And of course, most of these, I would say, young people were from lower class backgrounds. And the moral disgust I felt in my belly as someone who was studying the law, wanting to um, uphold justice, was worse than what I felt like when I lived and worked in Myanmar, <laughs> an autocratic country. And of course, um, I, when I visited even North Korea, you know, as a tourist. And that's because for me, what I love about America is that we uphold these values of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and the sense of equality and justice. Yet it was just so egregiously opposite to that. And that's what really began my journey around understanding the nature of racial bias and racism. And the more I wanted to lead into the conversation, the more I learned that these issues have been going on for so long. And there are a lot of systemic challenges, you know, systemic racism that is in place. So for me, I was like, well, okay, I can, as an academic, I can talk about the cerebral stuff, but what do we do about it? I'm like very much like, okay, I like need solutions. And that's where I began to really, you know, lean back into the work of, you know, Dr. King, uh, James Baldwin, Toni Morrison. And even though they didn't have the same language as Sharon does or Joseph does, they were talking about mindfulness. They were talking about how we need to create a personal transformation within us to overcome these stories of otherness, to really feel our own humanity. And once we can begin to shift that mindset within ourselves, you know, that's when we begin to build a movement and connect with other like-minded people to address more of the systemic challenges. And as a lawyer, I know that to be true because I tried to work in the law for several years. And I saw that we have some of the most egalitarian anti-discrimination policies. You know, no law says you have to sexually harass women when they go to work. You know, law says you have to like discriminate against people of color or LGBT people or trans people even um, in most major cities. Yet this is what's happening. So what's going on? And this is where I'm like, this is unconscious bias, you know, and this is kind of the work that we as a humanity need to do to really evolve, you know. So what I hear you saying is that there's a real connection between the unconscious bias and the system. Yes. And you talk a lot about systems in your, in towards the end of the uh, book, Sharon. Um, which I think then comes back to this idea of, you know, we've been talking about systemic racism uh, so much, but really finding the, the ways to address systems, you know, beyond the personal is, is such a, um, it's such a challenge. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. Well, I think it actually comes back a lot to what Anu started with because of this that is, you know, and uh, it, it's almost a kind of mental training. I mean, he, he provides it, you know, Anu provides it in his work. It's like uh, I've seen it so much that even as people move often through mindfulness, you know, uh, in a very classical practice, say, toward greater compassion, um, there's another facility of being able to look at systems. Like the example I use a lot, which I've seen so many times is 
somebody will come to me and uh, say, you know, I started meditating and then I was taking a walk and somebody came up on the street and asked me for a dollar and I gave them a dollar because that is my general practice. But this was the first time I ever looked that person in the eye and realized it was a human being. So that is a huge transformation right there. But what I go on to say is that person may not then ask, what's the housing policy in this city right. that is having so many people live on the street? You know, that's almost more like a kind of applied mindfulness, which, you know, again, is what I think on his work is really a, a wonderful example of. It's like, how do I apply it to see, in a way, look deeper? I use the example in the book of um, Sulak Shivarakstra, who's a Thai activist who came to visit uh, here in Barry, Mass, which is where I am right now, home of the Insight Meditation Society, which is next door in that direction, now closed uh, for the <laughs> moment. And uh, it... Um, and somebody asked him about the about sex trafficking in Thailand, and he said, "If you want to thwart or undo sex trafficking, look at agricultural policy. You know these farmers are starving is a reason why they may be selling their children and it It never left me you know that idea like look deeper, look for causes and conditions if you want to affect change in a bigger way, but that doesn't obviate, and I tried to make the point in the book the one-on-one -on -one, person to person relief or uh, presence or solidarity or help you may be offering one person because sometimes I think we uh, go to that extreme as well and feel this is negligible. It's nothing. It's, it could never be enough because I'm not upending this system of oppression, but it matters to that person. And it's perhaps how, maybe we need like a big, big vision and a willingness to step by step do the good that's in front of us. Yeah, and I think what I'd like to add to that is one of my big aha moments around this work um, was actually on retreat, um, <laughs> probably with you, Sharon, um, years ago. And, you know, for me, I realized that when we talk about systems and we talk about institutions, all of these systems and institutions are made up of people. Mm -hmm. And made up of people like you and I. And, you know, so who are those people that designed that agricultural policy? Who are those people that designed those housing policies? And it's the level of consciousness that those people have that have really determined the course of action, you know, that th that particular agency is taking. And for me, that's what my work has been about. It's really about helping decision makers who are making policies, make all these things that are unconscious conscious. Helping these individual, individuals really cultivate that level of empathy and compassion and perspective taking that makes them feel separate from people, from humans who are homeless or humans that are otherwise marginalized. So they can actually be able to design policy based on those individuals' lived experiences. I'm really curious if you feel that there's a the sense of the past being in the present. You know, that that there wasn't somebody right now who designed this, uh, many of these systems of bias and, and racism that we've inherited. And yet, and yet we take them for granted and forget that we can design something else. Yeah. Think about that. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the idea of race, you know, human races, you know, four or five races, such a recent phenomenon. I mean, of course, you know this, Rachel, because you study this so intimately, yet it has infected our global consciousness. You know, and it was just a bunch of dudes that love to collect skulls of human people and that came up with the story and created this arbitrary, artificial story that then ad was ad adopted by policymakers very similar to the story of gender, right? That, that story is, you know, a few thousand years old, but, you know, we actually don't know why it is that we made this gendered caste system that has become a global phenomenon where we basically dispose half of humanity, right, from truly achieving their full, vibrant potential. And so these stories then become kind of fixed and then prevent us from actually living 
um, you know, with one another, and also from really being able to untap into our own potential. And that's what I think is the biggest tragedy of it all on the one hand, but then I think about the retreats I've sat on with Cher and I'm like, well, that's why we do the work we do. Because if it was not there, then who would do that, you know? What do you think, Sharon? Well, I mean, it's such a, um, my mind keeps going back to the incredible delicacy of that work. If you are in a place of privilege or power or decision-making or leadership, because I, I keep thinking about, um, I was in uh, California for the month of, month of February, and I keep referring back to it because it's now taken on epic proportions. Like I went somewhere, you know, I, I was on a journey <laughs> once uh, in February and I was doing a program and there was a psychologist present in the program. And at one point she said, the brain filled with shame cannot learn mm. and i just find it such a, an interesting moment it's like a moral reckoning and at the same time if somehow we spiral into just a kind of um endless shame about it mm. we may not have the energy to learn which is really the whole point right it's change and and making change so uh, it's a very interesting process, I would imagine, in a direct confrontation with um, the bias we have held or the actions we have taken or uh, the consequences for other people from the actions we have taken, and yet how to have that sense of, of resilience or moving on or being able to uh, actively work for change instead of shutting down in some way. I so love that. The brain filled with shame cannot learn. Cannot yeah. learn. And I think this really goes, because I read one of Brene Brown's books years ago, right before I started Be More. And as we were thinking about creating our learning, learning journeys, I realized that we cannot induce shame in any of our programming, because shame prevents learning. Shame prevents behavior change. So I think... But I also think about all the people that are not learning right now, despite all of the clear evidence in front of them, whether it's around climate change, whether it's around inequity, poverty. And then I think about their bodies and their minds and the amount of shame that they carry within it and how that shame that's within becomes projected outwards. So that's when I, it becomes an imponderable for me, Sharon. <laughs> so I'm curious, like, in that moment, what can someone like me do? Like, I'm trying to hold compassion for people that are still supporting, let's say, the president of this country. Um, I try to feel compassion for those people that are marching as white supremacists, trying to feel into it. Yet, I know that this is causing harm. So what can I do in that moment? Well, I think that uh, obviously it's a very complex issue and, and I think we, we need to take action. We need to take the action that we are compelled to take. And I actually quote you in my book, kind of saying you realize you can't do everything. Yes. And so you put your energy and your dedication and your devotion into the actions that are calling you the most. And uh, we must act. And I think it's not so much a question of actively, honestly, trying to have compassion for those people we feel are causing endless harm. It's to, I think, refrain from hatred, mm. you know, which will just be devastating to us and debilitating. I think that uh, the compassion, I think, is actually there. It's not that hard um, in, on one level, especially if you understand compassion is not being a force of weakness, you know, and something that's going to just be like giving in, uh, but to realize that it's a very powerful tool. But I think that part of the issue is that I was, um, it was reflected in, in a, a program I was once a part of in Berkeley, California, and there were many, many people on the stage. And one of the questions from an audience member was basically, 
Um, when I look at myself, my own experience, I realize that I cause harm from a place of pain within me. And yet I look at some of political figures that I really dislike and who I think are causing tremendous harm. And they don't seem to be in much pain. They seem pretty self-satisfied, you know? (laughs) And what was so interesting was that there were all these people on the stage as presenters and it was just like complete silence. It's like no one wanted to answer. (laughs) And I answered finally, I said, I'm with you. You know, I feel like sometimes if they could just fray a bit around the edges, you know, that I'd feel a more ready kind of uh, empathy and compassion, which does not mean giving in. Um, But I use my own experience as a laboratory. I do believe these actions come from a place of pain and huge disconnection. And I believe, you know, right from my experience of the Buddhist teaching that the capacity of a human being is for greatness. Yes. Not just mediocrity, you know, and getting by and winning in a sort of conventional sense, that we have a capacity, each of us, for actual greatness. And to think about the choices that one can make so that one's life is that small and that divisive. And uh, what I think these days is, is this terrible realization that for some people their choices have led them to a life where if their terminal illness was announced today a lot of people would rejoice and i think what a life life. you've done that i do feel compassion but the compassion in no way holds one back from a kind of dedicated effort to see, well, yes, I I do feel for them and I wish that they could be free of suffering. And at the same time, I don't want them legislating my choices. Yeah. You know, and so that's the work. And if you can't get to the compassion, that's all right. But if you get, if one gets lost in uh, just bitterness and hatred and um, it's just almost like another form of fear and we're sunk, you know, because we can't go on. There's a great, quote in in your book actually you're quoting robert wright why buddhism is true and and it's um it's about this whether it's um it's it's a kind of rationalization of situational versus dispositional it's it's in somebody's genes as a, as it were versus uh it's the situation they find themselves in Could you say a little bit more about that? Because I feel like that relates to what you were talking about. Yeah, I mean, I will. And then I'd like to ask Anu about um, sort of the implications of that. He's talking about um, attribution bias. And the idea or the theory is that if someone um, we consider one of us, you know, uh, commits a crime or falls down in some way or exhibits something, you know, bad, then we attribute it to the situation. Oh, well, they were just in a mess or they had bad influences or something like that. Whereas if someone we consider part of the other does that very same thing, we think of it as like an intrinsic character flaw. Well, they're a bad person. You know, they don't have the capacity to grow or to learn. This is who they actually are. And so we fix that um, action as, as a kind of deep part of their character. So do you encounter that, Anu, in your work? And what do you do about it? I mean, absolutely. That's basically what's going on with a lot of the uprisings and protests around racial justice right now. You know, they're time in, I mean, Breonna Taylor's story is just, I mean, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, you name it, all of these people, right? And then you still have people that are using this thing, attribution bias, to make excuses and justifications. And then the giving of benefit of the doubt to those individuals who actually took life, you know, and the amount of harm and suffering those individuals have caused, not just the life of the people they took, their families and communities, but all of us as a society. So this is really kind of goes to the root of it. And for me, that's the work around really breaking bias, 
I mean, in this case, we're talking about breaking racial bias, but the foundation of racial bias is the belief in a story. You know, and there's an incredible book that actually would be an amazing complement to real change um, is this book called Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents by Isabel Wilkerson, where she goes to really describe the eight pillars of any caste system that exists in the world. And when it comes to this idea of race in America, you know, racism by itself is insufficient. It's insufficient to really describe the experience of all of us. What, what's really happening underneath of it and under, underneath this is this caste system, this unspoken caste system. And this goes to what you're, exactly what you're saying, this benefit of the doubt that is oftentimes given to people in the dominant caste. When it comes to gender, it's men, you know, cis, straight men. You know, when it comes to sexuality, it's probably, it's, you know, it's straight people. And when it comes to, you know, race and ethnicity, it's people who are white or European. So and I think that's where, you know, I'm actually curious, Sharon, because um, there's something in, you know, the Buddhist text that talks about this idea of being better than or less than or equal to. And this is something that I've been deeply, deeply reflecting upon because when we think about these caste systems, it's really that, that comparing mind, the judgmental mind. And I love that discussion in the book around, you know, formation of judgment in our minds. Um, but I'm curious, like what are, I'd love for you to just speak more about it, but also what are some practices we can begin to cultivate in ourselves to, you know, make friends with this judgmental mind, <laughs> not get rid of it, but, you know, transform it, transmute it. <laughs> yeah, transform is probably better thought than getting rid of it because it's not going anywhere. Um, uh, and I think that's actually an important point, you know, that, uh, I mean, you said it, Anu, when you talked about seeing your thoughts as thoughts. Uh, what we're really working toward is a sense of space, not to eradicate thinking or or those stories or anything, because that's not going to happen. But if we have enough space, then we're not entangled, we're not enmeshed, and we're not overcome. And then we have a choice. You know, is, is this a thought I want to carry out, or do I want to let it go? And I think, you know, so much power comes from how we pay attention, which is the whole theory behind mindfulness. It's like, we don't pay that much attention to one another. We don't really listen to one another necessarily. And so there's not very much basis for connection, um, you know, and, and we, there are a lot of reasons for that. And, you know, maybe especially now we're so physically isolated, some people, you know, not the people who are going out to work every day, but uh, many are physically isolated and um, it's all kind of weird, especially now, but uh, even in ordinary times, you know, we don't necessarily come together and listen. We don't have that sense of curiosity. And so much of that kind of layer of assumption can uh, dissolve when we actually connect. And prior to that or accompanying that, we need to be able to see thoughts as thoughts. So we need to be able to see assumptions as assumptions. I tell a story in the book about, um, it's one of those heavily disguised stories, so it always takes me a moment to figure out, like, what did I say, actually? Um, about a writer friend of mine who uh, was on a book tour, and he was somewhere, he gave a lecture, and in the course of the lecture, he said uh, how much Proust and uh, remembrances of things past had affected him as when he was a younger person. So he gave the lecture and then he was alone in a restaurant having dinner and this group of people came in and this woman of the group kind of split from the group and came over and approached him and he took a look at her and he thought, she doesn't look very smart. She looks like she's poorly educated, you know, probably kind of crass or something like that. And then she said to him, I went to your lecture and his heart just sank. And then she said, I really liked it, but I have to say that I get so much more out of reading Proust in the original French, which was a moment, right? So we hold these assumptions, we don't even see them, and they govern our responses, our reactions, our actions sometimes. And 
it is such a power of mindfulness to be able to see, oh, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm projecting. Let me check it out. You know, and that's not saying I'm a terrible person for holding this assumption. It's saying this is a conditioned reaction. And we want that choice. We want that sense of power. And one of the interesting reflections, I have not yet read cast, but I'm going to, but one of the interesting reflections I've had is how, uh, you know, the Buddha, of course, arose in a society with a very strong caste system. And he challenged it in so many ways. And one of the ways he challenged it was really a kind of social revolution. Um, these days, the Buddha's uh, very strong emphasis on the intention or the motivation behind an action is also held in a kind of critical light uh, because of the difference between intention and impact, which you can probably speak to. Um, but at the time, um, what the Buddha was saying, he was living in a society where one's kind of uh, morality, one's integrity, one's worth was very particularized based on caste and gender and so on. So what was appropriate and skillful and wonderful for a Brahmin male to do was forbidden to a Brahmin female or to a lower caste person. And so morality, good and bad, right and wrong, was all enmeshed in the caste system. And the Buddha came along and said, well, that's totally irrelevant. That means nothing. Mm -hmm. The only thing that matters is the intention behind an action. Are you coming from a place of greed? Are you coming from a place of love? That's what matters. Doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman or, you know, upper class, upper caste or, or an outcast. It does not matter. And it was this huge uproar, you know, because everything that was said to matter, he said, none of it mattered. So intention in the time that he was speaking uh, was really a revolutionary act. And so I wonder if you could just say something uh, about intention and impact. Yeah, no, I think, um, so I guess for people that may not know this debate, basically a lot of times, you know, we say something or don't say something, we act in a certain way, particularly around this idea of microaggressions, right? Unintentionally causing harm. Um, so we're like, well, I had really good intentions, but if we've said something, the impact of that is still harmful to someone else. So that's where I think a lot of people, particularly folks that have been harmed, you know, people who are subordinate, whether it's on the gender hierarchy or the race hierarchy or sexuality hierarchy, are really speaking up and they're like, no, this is harmful. Like, you have to look into this. And it's interesting that you mentioned the Buddha here because um, I do agree with the Buddha. I think it is intention that, you know, trumps impact in this way, but it's, it's actually the impact doesn't even occur because oftentimes, even if we have good intentions, it's very different to be to have good intentions versus having intentions that are um, colored by delusion, by ignorance, right? So a lot of times, what we call good intentions are actually polluted by ignorance, and that's why you know it has the impact that it does, which is it causes harm. So, you know, I'm not an apologist for the Buddha, but I'm just stating the fact that in my lived experience, that happens to be true, which is what the Buddha said. Um, you know, test it out for yourself. Um, so that's how I see it. And I think here we're kind of in this human soup together. So like something that you'd said, which was really, um, that really resonated with me is that, you know, when we notice thoughts, we don't just become ashamed of having these thoughts. You know, it's a conditioned response. And that has been really helpful for me because, you know, I think this is part of the design of the system too. You know, I'm an organism that grew up in the system with many, many causes and conditions. And particularly living in the West, in the United States, we feel like, you know, this rugged individual and it's all up to me. And if I fail, it's my fault. But that's again, that's part of this larger narrative to keep us in guilt and shame, right? It might be our puritanical values of our ancestors. I don't know what it is, um, but that's again, also ignorance, that's delusion. The part of like strengthening the mindfulness practice is to actually let go of these stories of perfectionism, of being right. And actually, you know, you know, Rumi once said that, you know, beyond the field of right or wrong, or you know, beyond the right or wrong, there's a field and I'll meet you there. 
Like it's really being okay with going to that field, you know, um, beyond these stories of right or wrong. Intention is such an interesting word to me because there's the, the idea of intention as in neat, you know, the idea that you're going somewhere and you're very conscious of it. I, yeah. I, I think Buddhism has that idea of, of intentionality. But then there's the sort of good intentions. It's a, it's a little bit like, well, I have good intentions, didn't you get it? <laughs> it's not very deep, it's very superficial. And, and we use them, we use those words interchangeably, but they're not interchangeable. Yeah. Yeah, well, the intention, you know, within the Buddhist context is, is a very, very important factor in an action. It's kind of a mystery, you know, because only we can actually know our intention. And we know if we're, we can, though, if we pay attention. Uh, if we're giving somebody a gift because we like them and we want them to have it or because we see, oh, they have that really cool looking object. Maybe if I give them this, they'll give me that. Or maybe we're in front of a room full of people and we want to be seen as a generous person. Or maybe there's something kind of awkward or hard to, to utilize in what we're offering. And we actually don't like the person and we're kind of here, you know, have this. And it's the same gesture. It's the same smile, but it's actually coming from a totally different place. And so this is an arena of investigation for us. And um, and it's not the end of the action, it's it's the spark. You know, there's also the skillfulness or the unskillfulness of the execution. And so this is a lot what Anu was referring to, you know, it's some sensitivity, it, it's some awareness of context and including cultural context. And it's like a bigger or broader mindfulness. And that's important too. It's just not given the primacy of, of um, the force of intention. and. Uh, but it's a big learning arena, and it's an arena where we can learn, uh, which is kind of the good news. That's very exciting news, that we can learn skills of communication and um, understanding that that is really possible for us. At the same time, we can see what our motivations are and decide where we want to go forward and what we want to let go of. That is another thing I used to say a lot going into companies or organizations to teach is before a major meeting, before this big phone call, just kind of pivot your attention within and see what do I really want to see happen the most? Do I want to be seen as right? Do I want a resolution? Do I want to be like a mentor? Do I want to be a help? Do I want to grind them into dust? And, and that will reveal a lot. So I have an example here, actually, that, would, that might illuminate this idea of intention. This actually happened in a retreat with you, Sharon. It was a forgiveness retreat that we were attending. It was after a week-long meta retreat. Um, and, you know, I was really kind of, because there's so much space, right, and we're just with our thoughts and our minds, I was really investigating the ways I may have harmed other people and at least forgiving myself for causing that harm. And in context of the work that I do, I remember several occasions in my, you know, I was probably in my early 20s at the time um, when I had used the word white, you know, to harm other people, right? So my mind was justifying it in all sorts of way, you know, privilege, access to resources, they caused me harm, great. Those things may be true, but then because I had so much spaciousness at this retreat, I was able to go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the intention and the energy beneath that intention. And the energy beneath that intention was to dominate, was to cause harm. And once I saw that, well, I have the seed in me. You know, it's not just something that's out there. I have it in me too. That's where, you know, I could really begin to start the healing process. First of forgiving myself, which took a while, and then to actually seek forgiveness, or at least say that, you know, I apologize. So like, at least there could be some atonement for that. So last question, we're unfortunately going to have to end soon, but that really got me thinking about it. Uh, the, the role of forgiveness and this idea, this book is called Mindfulness to Heal Ourselves and the World. So if you had a couple of last 
thoughts on that topic before I wind up. That would be great. That is the biggest topic ever. <laughs> it's very hard to a small thing. I mean, I think, again, we have to see what we mean by the word. You know, uh, one of my colleagues, Sylvia Borstein, one of her great quotations is, forgiveness does not mean amnesia. You know, it doesn't mean wiping the slate clean. It means not being, I mean, Anu just gave the most beautiful example. You know, it's not being lost in, in identifying with only one thing, you know, in this case, forgiving oneself, you know, not identifying with that act, that way of being as though it were forever, you know, and intrinsic to who we are to understand forgiveness and the truth of change are very tied together. Uh, Not that we can decide someone else is going to change, but uh, it's understanding that if we are consumed by the actions in this case of somebody else, Um, as somebody quoted to me who was just coming out of a period like that, he said, I let him live rent free in my brain for too long. Mm. You know, so again, it's about the freedom of one's own mind and heart. And it's, it's really possible, I think, to, to come to these places. I have nothing to add. That's so beautiful. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, uh, I I could talk on and on, um, but we're gonna we're gonna take a pause as we say these days. Uh, perhaps, hopefully, some people will get the book, and and uh, you know this is a great moment for some meditation. So, uh, first, I, I really want to thank both of you for being so generous coming together. Uh, we will have this talk available online in the next day or so uh, on Asia Society's YouTube and uh, we thank you all for for being a part of this. Uh, I just want to let you know about one new program that's coming up on September 17th at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is a program that Asia Society is partnering on called Rise or Fall Together, One Shared World on Interdependent it's free sign up please register it's a new group called one shared dot world uh some amazing speakers as you can see here uh and i think that the idea of interdependence is at the core of what we've been speaking about today uh both in terms of of our own being but but sharing this planet uh not only with other human beings but with other beings and actually, I love the, the Native American idea. You know, the entire earth is, is a different kind of being. So to, to really think about that uh, and, and to try to find solutions. So again, one, one shared dot world, you'll see the rise and fall together uh, summit on the 17th. And I just want to finally say uh, that we here at the Asia Society have been uh, trying to pull together programs and part of the Culture Matters series uh, and other programs. And we look to you for support. If you are able to donate, please do go to asiasociety.org. And in any case, your contributions are all part of our great interdependent moment. (laughs) Thank you all for being with us, whether you're here at this moment or you're in the next moment in the pre-recorded or recorded moment. So you can see how this could keep going. Uh, But again, thank you, Sharon and Anu. It's been a delight. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you so much.